All right. Um, <clears throat> my name is Patrick Shafto, and the title of my talk is uh, Human Recommender Systems from Benchmark Data to Benchmark Cognitive Models. And this is joint work with Ulfa Nasrawi at University of Louisville um, and generously sponsored by the National Science Foundation. <clears throat> So the, uh, the starting point or the launching point of, of the talk is to, to think about sort of the, the past or where classic um, uh, statistics and machine learning that are being imported into recommender systems um, and how they're used today. So in particular, um, they, they tend to make, uh, these algorithms tend to make strong assumptions about the process by which data were generated. Um, so, for example, we might assume that uh, we have random samples from some latent population, for example, and we may have a lot of them. Um, and then we train our model in batch and work backwards to some, uh, some uh, using some guarantees about uh, approximating the, the true population statistics. Um, so this is one paradigm. A second paradigm uh, involves having uh, cleanly cultivated uh, expert labels for, uh, for certain elements of data, and this is, of course, uh, more common for supervised learning. Um, <clears throat> and so these, these are the traditional assumptions in which a lot of the uh, machine learning and statistics methods were developed. Uh, and to support this, people have, uh, people traditionally created uh, benchmark data sets that allowed you to compare uh, across algorithms, um, and also just to ensure that we had high quality data in, in order to train um, and, and understand the behavior of algorithms. <clears throat> and what I would like to uh, point out today is that these machine learning and statistics algorithms are increasingly applied in situations that uh, the data are collected non-randomly. Um, that is, the data are often collected uh, with a purpose in mind. Um, they're often collected in small amounts, um, and the, the models are often incrementally trained. So to give you an example, um, we can consider Amazon. Here are some of the recommendations they recently gave to me. Um, uh, you can see there's a little bit about Boston, so they knew I was coming here, perhaps. Um, uh, but the basic point here is that Amazon has selected some uh, tens of items uh, to present to me. And these are non-random selections, of course. The, the goal here is that they want me to buy more stuff, presumably. Um, and so uh, this, is a, this is obviously a, a potential source of bias in, in terms of the, uh, the kinds of learning that can be done. Moreover, um, my choice of whether to click on something or uh, rate it or purchase it um, has its own systematicity to it. Um, these are non-random selections by the user also. Um, and then, <clears throat> Uh, the, you know, of course, periodically these uh, recommendation systems are then retrained based on these two uh, non-random streams of information. Um, and so if we were going to uh, draw a schematic base uh, about this, we might do something like this, where we get suge suggestions from the algorithms, um, and then we get some ratings by the, uh, by the users. Again, neither of these processes is random. Um, <clears throat> and then the algorithm is updated, and we get more suggestions and more ratings. Uh, and of course, this is not a random sampling process. This has a Markovian structure at minimum, um, where there's uh, the suggestions that are provided at time t depend on the ratings and suggestions on time t, t minus one. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, this is actually an instance of a pretty well-studied phenomenon uh, known as iterated learning, um, uh, where the learning process is not based on random sampling, but is instead based on uh, a Markovian process where information is, uh, uh, you get little bits of information and, and beliefs are updated, and by some sampling process, information gets passed down. Um, and so the question of performance of these algorithms um, needs to be recast in this context as uh, the behavior of a limiting or uh, stationary uh, distribution of a Markov chain. Um, uh, <clears throat> and so, uh, as I said, these have been explored, of course, in probability theory and, and Markov chain theory, but also in iterated uh, uh, learning and cultural evolution. Um, and so the key questions then are, under what conditions would we expect our algorithms to converge to the truth? Um, and, uh, or given the goal of the system, what kinds of uh, systematic defects would we expect to arise? Um, so to get, give you a sketch of the sort of standard iterated learning setup, um, we can draw it out in a graphical model as such. 
Um, so if we look at the three uh, nodes on the left-hand side, there is X, which is the, the information provided by the algorithm to the user. There is Y, the ratings or labels um, or, or purchases by, uh, by the user. And then H, which is the inference the algorithm would draw based on this information. And of course, this uh, unravels in time where we get copies of the same thing. So then um, we have the same three nodes uh, repeated over time. Um, the key uh, point here is that in this pure iterated learning uh, scenario, the, the data, the Xs are independent of the algorithm, so this is not like our, our recommendation uh, setting. Uh, nevertheless, um, we, we know something about the behavior of algorithm, uh, uh, of, uh, or the guarantees about uh, the stationary distribution of this process, assuming Bayesian learning. Um, this is going to converge to a mixture distribution um, where uh, the mixture is between the prior probability of the hypotheses and uh, the weight of the data. Um, and so that depends in part on the sample size the, at each iteration. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, the, the framework that we want to adapt to the recommendation setting. Um, and to adapt it, we need to specify a dependence between, um, between the Xs uh, and the previous hypotheses. And so we can do this by introducing um, Oops, we went backwards. Uh, this, these red arrows here, um, and these indicate that there is some dependence. And so this is a very general framework, not specific to recommendation, um, but we might uh, be able to adapt it to all kinds of settings. Um, and so what we want to ask is, um, what are the consequences of different assumptions? And so we might uh, consider a simple case like recommendation where we want to uh, select examples that tend to, uh, that the user tends to like. Um, so we want to specify a conditional distribution, X given H. Um, and so here we specify this as a mixture distribution, where on the right side, the Q represents an unbiased sample from uh, the true distribution, and the bit um, uh, in between is the probability of seeing, uh, of selecting X um, by the algorithm, um, where we uh, basically formalize this as the, uh, uh, the algorithm selecting examples that the user wants or likes, and that's indicated by the Y equals one, indicating that they actually like this in a binary sort of setup. Um, and the neat thing that we can do with this is we can uh, ask about the transition probabilities between hypotheses and derive the transition matrix um, for this uh, using sort of standard pieces of, of Markov chain theory. And what we can show, for example, is that the stationary distribution here is a mixture of the prior probability and the bias um, that's induced by filtering. Um, and we can get a sense for that filtering bias by thinking through a simple case where we just uh, sample uh, we only ever sample the best item. So we pick X that uh, maximizes the, the probability that the user likes that item. Um, this is gonna give us a distribution um, at, uh, like this, where we, uh, the probability is one if it's the best uh, or uh, most uh, liked item, uh, likely to be the most liked item according to the user, and zero otherwise, and update our transition matrices. And the key point here is that now uh, we never choose X for which a rating is uncertain. We always choose the item uh, that is most likely to lead the learner to uh, be pleased with the outcome. And so this is an instance of, in the behavioral literature, what we might call confirmation bias. Um, and we have no or very limited learning as a consequence of this. So we can walk through this for a variety of cases. Um, active bias is another possibility where you get the flip. Um, but what I'd like to do is turn to the second source of bias quickly, um, uh, which is, all of these uh, analyses assumed uh, that the ratings or labels uh, were either complete uh, or that they were uh, missing at random. Um, but of course, people have goals um, and they introduce their own sources of biases and we can extend this framework to capture this idea. Um, so we would introduce, uh, for example, by introducing a new variable A, which indicates whether the, the user acted or not. Um, and then update our uh, posterior distribution to include the probability of acting, where we might formalize the user's choice in terms of um, choice theory, where they're uh, then selecting items based on their perceived utility of, of, uh, of actually doing the actions. Um, and there's a whole rich literature in cognitive science that dates back a long way in, in some cases, um, but more recently has uh, developed alongside reinforcement learning um, to formalize how users' choices depend on goals. Um, and so that can be used uh, to sort of capture uh, these potential sources of, uh, second sources of bias. 
We can also use this to formalize uh, the defects introduced um, in, uh, in learning through bi biases on the human and algorithm side. So a human, uh, uh, blind spots on the human and algorithm side, I should say. So on the human side, um, these are items that the, the user never gets to see. On the algorithm side, it's the items that the uh, algorithm never gets uh, to see ratings of. Um, and so these are useful tools for quantifying um, the systematic biases introduced um, and, and uh, through this iterated process. So the basic point that I want to highlight is that in standard recommendation or filtering settings, the data are dependent on the model's inference. Um, and we've introduced a formal uh, approach um, that's been used before in, in behavioral literatures um, to analyze the consequences, the long-run consequences of these. Um, and one of the implications of this is that um, benchmark data sets might no longer be enough. That is, we might have to move towards something slightly more sophisticated to capture these uh, complicated dependencies between the algorithm's choices and the people's reactions to those choices, um, in, in particular in their choice uh, of whether to act or not. Um, so we might need to develop benchmark models of human behavior that allow us uh, to uh, generatively uh, 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 develop our uh, new uh, subsequent algorithms. And so uh, this work is uh, online if you're interested. You can uh, take a look at one of either of these papers, um, or both of them, I should say, um, on my website and also on Ulfa's website. Thanks. So. This is a very interesting line of work, and thanks for presenting it here. I, I'm, one thing that I'm curious about, how do you account for what we see you know, normally in these kinds of settings in that users are not just rating the output of the recommender system, right? So they're, what they see from a typical, say, e-commerce site, the recommender system is a, you know, a fraction of that, and the things that they rate may be you know, not related to what gets recommended. I mean, so it's, it's a mixture of things and not, you know, what, what they, and actually, in many sites, it's a very complex dependency between, you know, the user's past history and the set of things that, that show up. Can you give a, a sense of what, what things in particular you're thinking well, of? Well, I'm thinking, say, of Amazon.com, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there are going to be, you know, some items that are recommended, some things that show up because I searched for some particular thing, some things that, um, you know, there are multiple recommendation algorithms, so, you know, things come up for a variety of different reasons. Um, you know, I put things in my wish list. Uh, you know, other people put things in their wish list. I mean, there's just a wide variety of, of reasons why an item shows up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, the, the, the complexity of the situation doesn't change the, the fundamental point. Um, it does make the analysis of uh, the consequences much more complicated, though, and I think that's kind of what you're highlighting, is that um, in these settings you might have uh, uh, multiple competing uh, uh, recommendations or just stuff. Um, and, and so working backwards to attribute it might be complicated. Um, uh, and, and I think that's, that's a good point, but nevertheless, I think uh, we should endeavor and, and can endeavor to consider cases where we might actually be able to work, do that backwards inference. At least if you want a system that works really well, um, uh, it's a good idea to be able to figure out uh, to set it up in such a way that you can uh, solve the causal attribution problem of why people do what they do. Oh, thanks for this talk. It's a really fascinating topic about bias. And it seems like you're taking an approach that is model dependent. And you're assuming there's a Bayesian model that you can construct that then gives you some inferences. A parallel approach that's been also in Rex's prior papers is take a model independent approach and then use techniques like propensity score matching or any other kind of reweighting on the examples you get to remove the bias. So do you have any thoughts on how to maybe combine or how these methods compare uh, in different recommendation system scenarios? Um. <clears throat> Well, uh, the, the approach here, of course, we, we did exploit probability, but as I, as I showed, um, there's nothing particularly uh, that has to be Bayesian in this context. Of course, we can analyze maxes, in, in, indeed I did that. Um, and so I think there, there are a wide variety of, of ways to extend what we've done here to, to be more relevant to more different algorithms that people have used, but we, we haven't done that yet. But I, I agree it's a good and important direction to go. 
Shalad Sen, McAllister College. Um, there's been a couple experimental studies that kind of are related to, give you experimental evidence for the, these uh, kind of theoretical findings of yours. So the one that comes to mind is the one by uh, Salganik and Duncan Watts, the experimental evidence for artificial cultural markets, this paper. Um, have you done any thinking about the, how kind of your theoretical results here align with the experiments that have been done or don't align or what they say about it? Uh, it's a really good question. We haven't looked in, in the recommender system literature, at least, um, to, to align uh, those results. But as I said, the, the framework that we're adopting is, has been validated uh, a number of times in the cognitive science literature and adjacent sort of problems. That doesn't guarantee that it's, uh, it's going to do well in recommender systems. But, uh, but yes, it's a good question, and, and it's future work that we should be doing, yeah.